This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. Welcome to A Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest today is Gur Charan Das, who is the author of the much acclaimed India Unbound. He writes a column for the Times of India. He was CEO of Procter & Gamble India before he took early retirement to become a full-time writer. His new book is The Difficulty of Being Good, The Subtle Art of Dharma. Welcome to our program. Where were you born and raised? Well, I was born in undivided India and uh, before Pakistan was created. And so I'm a refugee from that part. And I grew up in Punjab, which is in the northwest of India. And looking back, how do you think your parents uh, shaped your thinking about the world? Well, my father was a mystic, hmm. but my mother was a very practical woman. He was a mystic, but he was an engineer. And so <clears throat> my, our friends, uh, when I was growing up, used to go to Kashmir for holidays, and, but we had to go to the guru's ashram <laughs> because <laughs> of my father's hmm. mystic inclinations. And, and so uh, in terms of combining a, a kind of a, a religious sensibility but a, a businessman's uh, vocation, was, was this the push where that came from or was it really your later education? I think it probably the most important factor was my, were my undergraduate years mm -hmm. at Harvard when I did read philosophy. And, and uh, how, how did you happen to go to Harvard? Uh, was that uh, uh, something encouraged by your parents? Or? No, I think I lucked out. I mean, my father had came for a couple of years to the United States. Uh, at that time, I was in, went to high, an American public high school. And my parents were going back home. But I got this scholarship. To Harvard, and so I uh, went there. And and you studied under John Rawls uh, yes, while you were there. That's and, and, right. I wrote uh, my and was that under was him. was that a, a substantial influence? I get the sense from the book that it was. Yes, yes, I think so. I think that uh, he made me think of certain things which I hadn't thought before, mm -hmm. and uh, the, the whole question of justice, equality, inequality, liberty in our lives. And, but then you went back to India when, and then you went into business, not into philosophy, right? Yes, well, you know, I was supposed to go on to do a DPhil in philosophy, a, a PhD at Oxford, but at the last minute I got cold feet. And I suddenly said, do I want to spend the rest of my life in that abstract stratosphere of thought. And so <laughs> I went, at, and, and I went to business by accident because my parents could not understand, you know, why they had an unemployed son after a good <laughs> education. And partly to get them off my back, I got this job. And then, like the man who came to dinner, I stayed on. <laughs> and, and did well, because it, 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 you were the, the head of Procter yeah. & Gamble India. Yes, I became the CEO of the company. But then, uh, and, and what, just out of curious, curiosity, what did you learn from that experience? Well, many things. Uh, learned uh, that the importance of action, mm -hmm. the importance of determination. You know. Uh, my education, like the education of most people, is bi strongly biased towards intelligence, intellect, thought. And those are not necessarily the virtues that move the world. 
Mm. What moves the world are virtues like uh, determination, st almost stubborn mm. determination. I found leaders, uh, the best leaders I've met, had two qualities. One was determination and the other one was, uh, believe it or not, humility. Oh, they were ambitious, but their ambition was for their work not necessarily for their stock options. And, and did the humility uh, enhance their leadership quality so that because they understood the importance of other people in the organization, it allowed them to, to be seen as a leader and not just be leading? Yes, I think what it, the humility was expressed actually in an idea that I've explored in the book as well, which is the notion of what Krishna is teaching Arjuna uh, the idea of what we call nishkam karma or karma yoga, which is that you act for the sake of the action and not for the reward. Meaning that if you act so that you don't care who gets the credit, your work will be good. Mm -hmm. and, and this notion is something that uh, I found in uh, the best leaders. And they become very good models of sort of self-forgetting behavior. Is, is that a characteristic that you found in South Asian business leaders? Do you, do you think that's applicable generally? It's to, applicable generally yeah. all over the world. Yeah. Uh, before we talk about the book in a minute, I, I get the sense that the, the business experience was an important step in your ability to understand the text, which we will come to in a moment. Yeah. Yes, I think the business experience began by accident. And then I began, when I realized I enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. I enjoyed the rough and tumble of making deals and so on. However, uh, unlike my friends who played golf on the weekends, I wrote. And so this is how I, in my 20s, I wrote three plays. In my 30s, I wrote a novel. And, and, and so um, the business experience is definitely, I believe, uh, a very important part of, of thinking about right and wrong. And a lot of it is experience. You know, Plato and Aristotle both felt that you didn't learn, you didn't, these things you did not try to do when you were too young. You needed some experience. And, and talk a little about the, the experience as a writer because you obviously have become a writer in, in your new career. You write a column. What, what pushed you in that direction of writing even when you were a businessman? Yeah, well, I guess the day I graduated from Harvard, I knew I was going to write. I n knew I was going to write a novel, so I wrote a novel in my 30s called A Fine Family. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it was always there somehow. And, uh, and your even inclination, today, which your inclination, yes. yes. What we call swabhava in uh, Sanskrit. There's a, we all have human, we develop certain human inclinations and the way we are, which is a result sometimes of actions we do in the past, which we repeat, and therefore that we have an inclination to repeat that action the next time. Or it is because of what we eat, sometimes our inclinations, if we eat lightly and if we eat light food, we, our inclinations are different than if we eat very heavy food and so on. So at, at 50, though, you decided to retire, and then you undertook a, a new career. Why did you retire, and, and what did you decide at that point about what you were going to do? Pick up the writing? Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the, when I reached that point, it became uh, uh, quite apparent. Look, by then, I had worked for 30 years. And I asked myself that there's a very big world outside and how long can an adult come to work and look at the market share of <laughs> Pampers, Tide, 
Vicks Vaporub, Oil of Olay, and things like that. And I had done that. And so, particularly at that time, the, the India was changing, the reforms were taking place. And we, at this point, were in Cincinnati, which was the headquarters of Procter & Gamble. And my wife was a bit aghast when I suggested this because she said, look, just when we have started earning big money, you want to, <laughs> you want to retire. But I told her that we have earned big money for a couple of years and frankly, we have enough. And I promised her that her standard of living may not go up again, but it wouldn't go down. <laughs> and so she... She, she agreed, was a good sport. Yeah. And uh, she, she, she went along. And, and at, at, at this point in your life, you, you write a book about India and you probably had a lot to say about uh, the book was called India Unbound, its, yeah. its potential for That's for right. Economic I was the first person to predict the economic rise of India. And uh, when I wrote it in 2000, people thought I was smoking. Mm -hmm. But this was the basis of travels I had done. And, uh, and I was convinced that the reforms had created a new mindset in India. The young people's minds had got decolonized and liberated. And this was an important factor in uh, the rise. And, and of course, if I were that kind of person, I would be saying today, I told you so, because India has gone on to become the second fastest growing economy in the world. And now, I mean, it's had high growth for more than 20 years, and now it's entering, in, entering into another golden age of growth. And we can look forward to India turning into a middle-class country within a generation. Now, in, in your journey now that, that you've left the corporate world, you, you decided to go back to school and to study the, the, the text and, and, and in the original language. Well, that's exactly right. I mean, I wrote, I traveled around India, wrote India Unbound, came to this very happy conclusion that India's economic problem was the genie was out of the bottle and no politician could stop that. And, I mean, that was the good news. The bad news was the state of governance in India. That, and, the part, and you know, governance has two dimensions. It has uh, got the institutional dimension. For example, one out of four school teachers in a government primary school don't show up. In India. In yeah. India. And one out of four who shows up is not teaching. So half the 3.7 million primary school teachers are not working. And uh, I was appalled by this. But more than, I mean, the institutional dimension of this is that if you punish one teacher, all the rest will show up. But there's also a moral dimension, which says that, look, teaching is my dharma, my calling. And I'm preparing the next generation of leaders. And so you teach with inspiration and inspire young minds. And this is the side which is the moral dimension. I was concerned that corruption in India was eroding the moral character. And this partly drove me to the epic Mahabharata. And you wanted to then read it in the original, right? Yes. yes. I mean, I had studied some Sanskrit uh, uh, when I was at, at Harvard, and uh, where there was a great scholar, Daniel Ingalls, I've dedicated this book to these two people, John Rawls and mm -hmm. Daniel Ingalls. And uh, my Sans Sanskrit was very rusty, but I brushed up a bit and started reading. I went to Chicago, where there were the best Sanskrit scholars. And this has actually partly created a controversy in India. Why did this guy have to go to Chicago to study Sanskrit when he should have gone to Banaras or someplace? Uh, and, uh, so I um, 
I read most of the Mahabharata in translation, I must confess. But every day I made a routine to sit and read for an hour to two hours in the original as a kind of sort of uh, discipline, as a yoga mm -hmm. to, to, to get the feel of the text. I mean, I can read well enough so that I can look at the translation and go back to the original and check how the translator has, has translated it. Uh, what, there's an interesting point here that I want to, uh, you, you, you uh, essentially had embraced the modern world in your work as a businessman, and then, but you, you recognized a problem and you, you saw the need to mediate yeah. between the traditional yes. uh, culture and insights, you know, and, and the problems of modernity. What, what was the difficulty of doing that? Because you even, you even raise the question, the, in talking about your own methodology, you say, but in interrogating the text from the outside, I have to be extra careful and not try to impose a modern, secular sensibility on an ancient religious text. So that, that is a real obstacle course which you had to navigate. Yes, and I'm not so sure I succeeded. Mm -hmm. To be very honest, uh, I, 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 too often I look for a meaning in the text. Uh, and I worry sometimes that it's my education, my experience, my background, which is forcing me, <coughs> which is forcing a certain kind of reading of the text. And uh, the beauty of the Mahabharata is that it lends itself. It's a text full of ambiguity lends itself to many readings and, and that's why it's a classic. Uh, but fundamentally I went to the Mahabharata <clears throat> because it is n it is, it's an ancient epic, mm -hmm. 2,500 years old, between 2,000 and 2,500 years old. It is, uh, op it is unique in dealing with the world of politics. Secondly, in the Mahabharat, it's obsessed with dharma. Now, dharma can mean many things. It can mean law, duty, virtue. But essentially, it is trying to do the right thing. That's dharma, right and wrong. And <clears throat> you see, in the Greek epics, mm. for example, in, in the Iliad, Achilles does something wrong. But then he gets on with it. In the Mahabharat, the action stops and the argumentative Indian takes over. <laughs> and every character has a say on what went wrong. Now what this does is that when you, it makes you reason for yourself. It makes you, and good reasoning is behind good moral action. And moreover, nobody in the epic says, Let's ask God for that. What's Dharma? So, in, you know, in, in, the, in, the, in the Christian tradition, you have the Ten Commandments. So in here, you don't. And so it puts the burden of the reasoning on you. And finally, the notion of Dharma in the epic is a pragmatic idea. It is not seeking moral perfection. And therefore, it is a lot more suited up, suitable for our, for our policy makers uh, who have to deal with the ambiguities of life and who cannot afford to seek moral perfection. I want to point out one other thing about you as uh, the writer of the book, which is your stage of life, basically. You point out that in the, the Hindu tradition, uh, there are four problem sets, four goals in life, uh, and that, that uh, 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 tell us about that. But it, in, in Dharma, it's, you're searching for moral well-being, which actually goes with the stage of life you're in. Yes, that's true. The, the, a good life has four stages. The first stage is you could say brahmacharya, which is the stage of studentship, growing up. 
the second stage is grihasti, which is being a householder, meaning making a living. And the third stage is one where you begin to disengage with the active life and begin to ask the questions that I have asked in my book, which is the questions of meaning, why we do certain things on right and wrong, and uh, problems of suffering and things like that. And now let's turn to the text and briefly, what is this story about? Two, a, a family feud, Yes. Dude, lay, lay the groundwork so we can then talk about the characters. Well, it's the story of a, of the, of a rivalry for the throne in a royal family. It's two sets of cousins, children of two brothers. And to contain that rivalry, the kingdom is divided and the better half goes to the bad guys, the Kauravas, and the worse half goes to the good guys, the Pandavas. But the Pandavas are diligent, hardworking, talented, so they expand their territories. They've got a great, uh, they've got a great warrior, Arjuna, on their side. And suddenly they become very powerful. They become the most powerful kingdom on the earth. And so the elder brother is told, now you can hold a Rajasuya ceremony, which is going to uh, celebrate his coronation as an emperor. And to this ceremony are invited the nobles, the kings that they have subdued. They bring lots of wealth and tribute to their emperor. Also invited is the eldest brother on the other side, Duryodhana. And the main protagonist is the, the, the is, noble... Is the noble king Yudhishthira. Yeah. So who is going to be Honored. made emperor? Yeah. And uh, when Duryodhana from the other side sees the wealth and power of his cousins, he grows envious. Accompanying him is his uncle, who, uh, who looks at him, at his, at his nephew, and he says, my lord, you grow pale and sick. And Duryodhan says, what man of metal will stand to see his neighbor prosper and himself decline. Now in that awful, in that sentence, he has captured the awful nature of envy. That this is a, this is a universal sickness. And I don't think anyone is immune from it. You, the, the setup that, that you've given us shows the, the complexity of what you're dealing with in the sense that that on the one hand you have very human beings who are very complicated and we'll talk about our 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 heroes moral failing in a moment but but then are put in situations that bring out sometimes the best in them and sometimes the worst exactly basically. so you so this envy this is then i like the mahabharat i also stop the action mm -hmm. in my book like a storyteller and then I talk about envy, and I talk about the fact that how it begins very early. When I was five years old, there was a boy in our neighborhood who had a red toy engine. I hated him for it. <laughs> and when he was not looking, I broke it. They did a survey at Harvard with the class of 1987 and asked, would you rather earn $100,000 a year or two hundred or fifty thousand. Everybody said a hundred thousand. But then they put a condition. They said if you're earning hundred thousand, your friends will be earning two hundred thousand. But if you choose to earn fifty, then your friends would be earning twenty-five thousand. 
Do you know 83% of the people switched their answer? And so, you know, when I was running a company in Bombay, Procter & Gamble, our factory was next door to the Philips factory, who had been on strike for a whole year, and we were worried. One day, I heard the, the union leader of the Philips factory say, I don't care if we ever open this factory as long as the Dutch factory manager goes down. And that's when I understood the awful nature of envy, that if the sin of capitalism is greed, the sin of socialism is envy. And you have to read those novels in Soviet Union, Soviet mm -hmm. Russia, in the 1920s and 30s, to see how that society was seething with envy. But even in the European, if you look at the context, I never understood uh, really why decent middle class Germans in the 1930s were swayed by Hitler to do the most awful things to the Jews until I read that more than 50% of the professionals in Berlin and Vienna were Jews, and 64% of the physicians in Berlin were Jews, when Jews were less than 10% of the population of these two cities. Mm -hmm. So those societies were seething with envy. And that's why every country you know, has tried to come to grips with this problem. The Greeks used to exile you if you were too successful for 10 years until the envy cooled down. Mm -hmm. So, so your your challenge is at a, a writer is threefold: one, to to know the text, to to recount the dilemmas that these characters are in and their complexity, yeah. but then to elevate the meaning yeah. as a modern person, both with your own uh, with your own experience. Uh, experience, but also with your understanding of, of uh, historical events and contemporary events. Exactly. That's my project. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and so if we, if we come to the Mahabharat again, again. Uh, the uncle now, Shakuni, says to the Ryodhan that these chaps have become too powerful. The cousins. The cousins, they have become too powerful, the Pandavas. We cannot take them on in a straight fight. Mm -hmm. So we'll have to use strategy. What does he mean by strategy? Well, he says, I'm the greatest dice player in the world. And Yudhishthir. The, the, the king on the, the other king, side. Yeah. The emperor is the worst. But he's addicted to gambling. Mm -hmm. And moreover, I cheat, but nobody <laughs> knows how. <laughs> so they hold a gambling, they hold a dice game, very grand event, to, and, and which, to which all the nobles and kings are invited. And Yudhishthir loses everything, his kingdom, his brothers, himself and his wife. And so they drag in the queen. It's a patriarchal society to humiliate the men. And they call her their slave. But she's no weeping queen. Draupadi asks this question to the assembly. Who did my husband lose first, himself or me? Mm -hmm. And of course, they realize, the bad guys, that they have fallen into a trap because he had lost himself first, and therefore he was, by law, not competent to stake her because he did not possess anything to stake. But the Pandavas, the Kauravas, the bad guys, are not going to be stopped by this. And so one of them says, strip her. And so the younger brother, Dushasan, gets up and starts pulling her sari. And as he pulls her sari, the sari begins to extend infinitely. 
and half an hour later, huffing and puffing, he, in humiliation, he sits down. And at this point, the Mahabharat says, what happened here? How did this miracle take place? And it is suggested that it was dharma, that it was, she was a good woman. Dharma also means cosmic justice. That was cosmic justice that took place. But she, at this point, gets very angry. And she looks at this audience of kings and rulers and she says, how did you let this happen? And tell me, what is the dharma of the king? Now when she says that, what she's doing is making rulers, their civil servants, absentee school teachers, all look at themselves in the mirror to see how they deceive themselves. And this is the strategy of the epic. But she also looks at the grandfather, the respected, the most respected man mm -hmm. in the assembly. And she again asks this question, what is the dharma of the ruler? Everybody remains silent. And so she quotes a sage, Rishi Kashyap. And Kashyap says that when a crime occurs, half the punishment for the crime goes to the person who commits the crime. A quarter of the punishment goes to the person who abets the crime. But a quarter goes to the person who remains silent. And at this time, the election for the president of India was taking place. And this government nominated a, a woman for this job. The president of India is a ceremonial position, like the Queen of England. The power is with the prime minister. We were, I mean, delighted that a woman had been nominated. But then we heard very disturbing things about her background, that there had been a murder, an alleged, in which her husband had allegedly been involved. We heard that the family owned a bank, and this bank had gone into liquidation, had gone bust, because her family members had taken loans with no intention of paying them back. So I was writing a column in the Times of India, and I wrote an open letter to the Prime Minister called Don't Be Silent. And I gave the story of Draupdi and this never-ending sari. And I quoted the, the sage saying that a quarter of the punishment will go to the person who remains silent. So I said, for God's sakes, why don't you nominate another candidate? It's not too late. Another woman. But of course, nothing happened. And a week later, we had a new president who had replaced the most popular president in Indian history, this lady. However, it's a tribute to the Indian media that they never brought up her background again. Out of restraint, they respected the office of the president. And this is something I think Fox News could learn something about restraint. So, so what is it about a tradition that keeps it alive and that makes its insight relative, relative to contemporary situations? In, in other words, is it, is it the, uh, I guess the complexity is there, the, the richness of the insight but clearly the stories you're telling indicate that it, it's not really embedded in the modern culture and contributing to uh, affecting governance, for example, or leadership. Yeah, well, this is the difficult thing, of course. The Mahabharata is not a how-to book. But 
it is a book that makes us the, it's a it's a it's it's a text that makes us look at the well as i said holds a mirror to us uh it's very much alive i mean every child i heard it first the stories from my grandmother but these are stories that do instruct you mm-hmm. but they are not you know it's i mean my book is not going to end up in the self improvement section <laughs> of a bookstore and and it's but by engaging with these moral ideas it does i think contribute to to something the the key thing is the tradition is alive you know when the mahabharat was shown on indian television in the late 90s it had the highest rating there were 104 parts 104 weeks <laughs> it ran every sunday and the traffic would stop all over india between 9 and 10 o'clock in the morning and people would actually do a puja a prayer of the television set before the show came on and the when the episode i was telling you about dropdi being disrobed a, a a company in bombay marketed a dropdi collection of sarees <laughs> to cash in on this popularity of this program unfortunately they did not win much market share because their sarees did not extend infinitely <laughs> I see, I see. so so who is your favorite character in the book or do you have one well i think everybody's buddy's favorite character is is karna karna is uh the eldest son of kunti who is the mother of the pandavas the good fellows and but he's born illegitimate he, he kunti had been given a boon when she was a child that she could have if she were childless she could have a baby and it would be fathered by one of the gods and she had to just recite this mantra she was experimenting before she was married and Nine months later, she was looking at the sun, and she had this child from the sun god, who had beautiful earrings. He was born with these earrings and an armor plate, which made him invulnerable. He could, and <clears throat> she was so horrified when she had the baby. She floated him. on the river in a basket covering him up at the other end of the river he was picked up by a charioteer so here's a royal prince who grows up as a charioteer's son but he has a lot of talent and ambition and in those days if you had talent and ambition you didn't become a ceo you became a warrior and he grows to become the greatest warrior of his times even greater than arjuna however he is constantly slighted in society he wants the world to think he is a kshatriya a warrior but he is treated like a low caste low born charioteer's son and that is part of the pain of his story now he falls in love with dropdi the queen mm-hmm. who before she was married and because she was beautiful her father had a her father she was you know they were royals and nobles vying for her hand and to decide who should be her husband her father creates a contest and in this context you have to pick up a very heavy bow and shoot at a moving target and everybody fails except karna so he thinks he has won her and he goes up to be garlanded by her and to be declared a, a husband and she, when he approaches her she says i won't marry a sutaputra 
meaning a charioteer's son. She's a snob. <laughs> and, but this expression is even today when an upper caste person wants to insult a low caste person, he calls him a Sutta Putra. Mm -hmm. Anyway, Karna's story though is not just about being low caste in a caste society. It is also about a problem we all face as human beings like envy. And that's a problem of status anxiety. Mm -hmm. We all want to be somebody. We don't want to be nobody. And the fact of the matter is that snobs have a great capacity to inflict pain on us because they judge us only from our status. You know, there's no problem when we are babies. Whether we break our toys, whether we cry, or, or whether we burp, our mothers love us, but when we grow up, we are judged. We judge for our achievements. And this is a problem that afflicts us all. And the problem is that our self-esteem is held hostage to the opinion of others. That's why my friend's aunt used to say, you wouldn't worry so much what others think of you if only you realize that they don't. <laughs> They're thinking what others are thinking of them, and those others are thinking what others are thinking of them. And nobody's thinking about you. And so, you see, this is this aspect uh, of karna is something which I explore. Mm -hmm. And this is, you see how my strategy works in this epic, mm -hmm. that I come to a moral idea that a character is uh, in the midst of either a moral conflict or a problem or a, a moral emotion like remorse, like revenge, all these things, and then I, I discuss them. But let me not leave Karna for a minute because there's a war in this epic, and in this war, uh, before the war starts, the Panda, it's between the Pandavas and the Kauravas. Krishna, the God, is the master strategist of the Pandavas, the good guys. He realizes that these, these chaps are not going to win the war with Karna on the other side. So he goes to tell Karna who he is, to hoping to make him switch sides. So he says, look, you've always wanted to be a Kshatriya warrior. You are a warrior. Not only that, you're a royal warrior. Not only that, you're the eldest. So when with you and Arjuna on our side, we're going to conquer the world. And then we're going to win the war. And then you're the eldest and you will be king and Draupadi will be yours. Everything that he always wanted. But you know what? He does not switch sides. He, but what does he say? He says that your mother is not the one who gives birth to you. Your mother is the one who brings you up. So you see, the Mahabharata is actually a dark tale. Mm -hmm. um, everybody dies in this war. The victors have to rule over an empty kingdom for 35 years. But it is in moments like these that the Mahabharata snatches victory. You know, at the end of the epic, the Yudhishthir, the what we started with, the emperor, is going towards heaven. And at heaven, when he reaches heaven, the god of heaven, the heaven keeper, Indra, comes out. Now, before he gets to heaven, a stray dog attaches itself to him. So the dog keeps following him to heaven. So Indra says, when he arrives at heaven, great king, we have waited for this moment. Welcome. 
And instead of going into heaven, Yudhishthir says, but what about this dog? And Indra says, but he's not even your dog. He's just a dirty street dog. Besides, this is heaven. No dogs allowed. And so Yudhishthir says, what, what kind of place is heaven which does not even understand the ABC of Dharma? That if somebody comes to you for refuge, you help them out. Mm-hmm. Now, you know, nobody I know and you know would have done what Yudhishthir did. But every child in every culture will understand the meaning of dharma from this story. Mm-hmm. And I think what the Mahabharata is then trying to tell us is, yes, it's a dark world. We don't know dharma. It's very difficult. It's not like memorizing the names of the rivers of the United States. And our duties often conflict. But nevertheless, we know an act of goodness. And an act of goodness is one of the very few things we possess on this earth. Let, let's talk, because there's, there's one other character that, that really reveals another dimension here, which is uh, our, the dharma of a particular role. And here I have in mind uh, Arjuna's yeah. uh, entry into battle. Yeah. He's a, one of the greatest warriors. His charioteer is the god Krishna. And then at, at the moment of battle, he is in despair. Uh, yeah. Tell us about that. And, and, and Yes, that's a very, very important episode because here he is the greatest warrior on the earth and he's the commander of the good side, the Pandavas. This is the first day of war and he tells his charioteer, Krishna, the god, let's go to a point where I can see both the armies. And when he sees both the armies, he sees on the enemy side his uncles, his cousins, people he played ball with, his grandfather. And he says, I cannot kill them all. And it is his charioteer's unenviable job to Mm -hmm. tell him that it is his duty to fight. So it's an ironical thing that God is telling man to go and kill. And this is a celebrated moment, and Indians have debated for long who was right for centuries, whether it is Krishna, the God who is saying, go and fight, or Arjuna, the warrior, who says, I won't kill people. A few years ago, I was invited to the Pentagon to talk about India's future, economic future. This is a result of my book, India Unbound. And one of the generals at the Pentagon asked me, he was a well-read man, so he knew about this episode. And he said, how is it that a commander can say something like that uh, on the very first day of battle? He says, it's, it's like as though Eisenhower said to his driver before the Normandy landings that I don't want to kill people, I don't want to fight. So I explained to him that the significance of this episode for me is not just that he's, he's not a commander alone, he's also a political leader. The night before, he was in the war cabinet who had, he's one of the brothers, mm-hmm. who had given, Arjuna, yes. Arjuna, who has given the order to fight, to, give, to declare war. And so I think what he's illustrating is, he's like a defense, secretary of defense also. And what it's illustrating is that we want our political leaders, this is not about generals, we want our political leaders hmm to raise the moral question before they take us to battle. Now, you know, a few years ago, 
Mr. Bush took this country to war in Iraq. And I bet you there was a similar meeting of the war cabinet in which they debated the economic consequences of the war, the political consequences, the oil in Iraq, Israel, Palestine, and all the other implications. But I bet you nobody in that cabinet said tomorrow we are going to war and we are going to kill a lot of people. Some of them will be innocent civilians who will die and many will be our own people who will die. Now in the end they may still take us to wars but we want them to at least pause and in their cost-benefit analysis factor in the moral dimension as well. So, so what the, the epic captures and what you were trying to renew and bring to the table is this strange combination of human virtue and vices uh, on the one hand. In the other, a context in which uh, things unravel, in which there is death, in which good deeds go unanswered or sometime with bad deeds. That's right. But Krishna says, I think to Arjuna, that basically, you know, you have a duty to fight, but it's your decision. So, so it's, it's bringing to the fore a recognition of human frailty, the human condition, but then human. we have, humans have to decide. Yes, human choice. That the idea that, that, and that brings responsibility. Because if you have to decide, that means you have the responsibility for your decisions. Mm -hmm. say. Our, our hero is, uh, embodies some of the great virtues and vices. He has a, a gambling vice, but he believes in nonviolence. In the end, he has the compassion that says, hey, if this dog, <laughs> street dog, isn't going to heaven, then I'm not going. Whereupon he finds out, I guess, that the dog is, is yes, God. That's basically. how epiphany takes. It's a test. Right. But, but, but the, the, the fact of the matter is that he has to limit, he has to live with the limits of yes. the human condition as he assumes the duty of, of leadership. Yes, absolutely. That's, that, is, that is correct. So, so what did you learn from this exercise? Uh, uh, obviously, there are many insights, there are many lessons, because the epic is so classic, but are there one or two things that surprised you? As well, you, it was a surprise. I mean, I had expected some answers. And uh, what it leaves you is almost in a state of despair because it says there are no easy answers. I mean, the title of my book is not the impossibility of being good, the difficulty. So we all have to struggle. What I learned is that it's, it's, uh, the world is a lot more ambiguous. And in a sense, you know, this is a good lesson for our times because we live in fundamentalist times. There are too many people who feel, and the extremists in all camps, who feel they have a monopoly on the truth. Whether they are fundamentalists of Islam, Christianity, Hinduism, but they believe in this monop monopoly on the truth and they're willing to kill for it. Now, this is a wonderful medicine for them to take because it, it says there are no monopolies on truth and questions of right and wrong will be ones that we will keep struggling with. And yet, it doesn't leave you in a sense that anything goes. Duryodhan is condemned. You know, he believes might is right. And it's very clear that moments like the dog and Yudhishthir tell you that there are universal things. Now, we may not all be able to behave that way, 
but we, we can have ideals. And what Oscar Wilde said, you know, we, we are all in the gutter, but some of us are looking at the stars. Well, this makes us look at the stars as well. And I guess that's the, the, the lesson, because a woman in Delhi, you know, went to the bookstore where she had bought my book after reading it for a month. And she said, I want my money back. And the <laughs> shopkeeper said, but why? And she says, well, I thought it would make me good. <laughs> and uh, it hasn't. <laughs> In fact, she says, I'm, I'm, I'm even more confused. And, 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 and uh, anyway, but that's, I think, the point is, that's why I said, you know, neither my book nor the epic will end up as a self-help mm -hmm. sort of book. But what it will do, though, is that it illuminates the human condition. It illuminates our, our search for a more meaningful life, which is the classic third stage uh, sort of problem our search for some kind of meaning. How, one final question, how do you think students uh, looking at your journey, what might they learn from that journey uh, and, and in what way does it for, inform them about how they should prepare for the future? Well, one thing of course is a lot of us say we will do that I will take early retirement at 50, which is what I do. A lot of people say that, but then they don't do it. The second, so that's the, the action, mm -hmm. <laughs> the brute act mm -hmm. of just breaking the momentum of your life. It's so difficult. You've gone to work for 30 years. You, your children, you've raised children, and you've got into a nice habit, a pattern. You've got friends, colleagues, you like them, you're comfortable. And uh, especially if you work in a very nice company like Procter & Gamble, you're very comfortable. And to break that takes, does take a bit of uh, determination. And the second lesson, I suppose, is that you sh before you do something, a reckless act that I did, you should have some kind of passion. You should know what you want to do after you, you know, there should be a reason to drive you to do that. Well, on that note, uh, I want to show, thank you for being on our program, but let me show your book first, The Difficulty of Being Good on the Subtle Art of Dharma, and uh, a very, uh, uh, well, I don't want to say useful, but a very informative guide uh, uh, f uh, for people who want to first find out what Dharma is, but also find how they can find their Dharma. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Thank you very much again. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. And thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history. Mm -hmm.